All right, first question, are too many supplements bad for the organs like the kidneys? So this is a very common idea behind taking supplements that if you take too many supplements, then it's going to harm your kidneys, it's going to harm your liver, etc. Now, my opinion about it is that you should just test it and see how does it affect your kidney markers because there's millions of people in the world who don't take any supplements but they have kidney problems and they have liver problems. So taking supplements isn't exclusively responsible for kidney problems or uh, liver problems. It all depends on the particular context, the individual, and what's the actual outcome. So there's always some like uh, amount of unexpectedness or randomness as well in this. So some people might react to certain supplements in a negative way that increases their liver enzymes or uh, worsens their kidney function. So the most important thing is to just measure yourself and see because if you don't measure, then you don't know if a certain supplement has a negative effect on your kidneys. Now, theoretically, you know, yes, certain supplements can negatively affect kidney function. And the most notorious ones usually are like creatine, which uh, the myth is that creatine causes kidney damage, which isn't the case. Creatine might worsen kidney function in people with already existing kidney, kidney dysfunction, but it's not inherently going to cause it. So again, you need to measure and depends on the individual. There's also a lot of uh, studies actually on specific herbal supplements, even things like ashwagandha, curcumin, some of the other herbal compounds. They uh, have been also found to, first of all, increase liver enzymes, as well as actually cause like acute liver injury in certain uh, individuals. Now, those are mostly case studies, so they're not like large populations of people getting kidney or liver problems from herbal supplements. It's mostly some individual case studies. And the problem, yeah, is like a lot of herbal supplements aren't regulated. They might be contaminated with certain compounds. So a lot of the herbal supplement market is, yeah, kind of like a wild west <laughs> or a no man's land in terms of that. So you never know really what you're getting. So I don't really take a lot of herbal supplements because it's yeah, potentially dangerous and it might have negative effects on your liver specifically. But uh, if you have third party tested and well trusted supplement brands, then theoretically for most people is not going to like worsen kidney function. You know, you just still have to measure, but uh, based on the evidence right now, then you don't see that. And of course, there are some cases if you have maybe certain supplements interact with each other, or if yes, if there are like hundreds of compounds, then maybe it can worsen kidney function. Now I have found on Twitter actually a few people, uh, e even like doctors, like pretty renowned doctors saying that they've seen a lot of people taking a very popular supplement stack that is popular right now, and uh, that it worsens their kidney, their patient's uh, kidney function. Now they didn't mention what stack it is, they did say it's popular right now, so you, you can maybe think, I'm not, I don't know exactly also what stack it is. I can predict which one it is maybe, but uh, yeah, theoretically, too many supplements could worsen kidney function. And uh, the most important thing is to just uh, measure. I'm taking, you know, right now, less than 10 supplements a day. My kidney function is perfect. My liver function is also like uh, very good. And even Joe Cohen, who takes 160 supplements per day, his uh, liver and kidney function is also uh, great, so he has no problems uh, with that. So again, the most important thing is, is to measure. Next question, as of my genetic test, I'm a slow caffeine metabolizer. You've mentioned in one of your VRP tips that vitamin C helps to break down caffeine. What are other things that help break down caffeine? So yes, the unfortunate situation is that there are genetically fast metabolizers and slow metabolizers of caffeine. And uh, I'm a, like a fast metabolizer, so I can drink coffee even like very late in the evening and I'll still sleep uh, very good. Whereas other people, yes, they drink coffee in the morning and even then they get insomnia or something like that. So yeah, caffeine, I think a lot of the negative effects that people have relating to caffeine intake has to do with their caffeine metabolism and genes. So if you are the slow metabolizer, then you tend to get more anxiety, you tend to get more like heartbeat problems or hypertension effects from uh, and, and insomnia effects as well from caffeine. Whereas if you're a fast metabolizer, then most of the fast metabolizers don't get any <laughs> negative effects because they metabolize the caffeine uh, very fast. And uh, yeah, what are some ways to kind of burn through the caffeine faster? Then yes, vitamin C uh, does that. So I mentioned that in my newsletter. And uh, there's also 
things like the let's say uh, th these are tubers like uh, carrots actually also do that so uh, what I like to do is like in the evenings I'll eat like orange or something I'll eat like an orange or kiwi that's high in vitamin C and uh, you know I don't drink usually caffeine very late in the day I'll stop it at uh, noon time typically but uh, just having the extra vitamin C in the evening I, I feel that yeah it's pretty kind of useful tip to have especially if you're a slow metabolizer now other things as well that increase your sleep drive uh, would be like exercise so uh, the higher your sleep drive the bigger your desire to fall asleep is so uh, if you've exercised a lot then uh, that has been found to increase sleep quality and also reduces the time it takes to fall asleep so and that those studies even find that the more exercise you do the better the sleep quality is so even if you exercise several hours a day then that gives you even greater benefits for sleep quality than exercising only you know 20 minutes per day so the more exercise you do the t more tired you will be and the better you will sleep and the second thing is also sunlight exposure so getting exposed to this infrared light from the sunlight increases melatonin production also increases sleep drive and uh, has been found to improve sleep quality and reduce time it takes to fall asleep and maybe last tip would be to not you know eat too late before bed so uh, and that includes um, s these small caffeinated beverages so like teas they have very small amounts of caffeine but if you're a slow metabolizer then even drinking tea in the evening can disrupt your sleep and uh, chocolate so you know uh, milk chocolate has very little or technically has no like legitimate amounts of cacao but uh, still a small amount of it can still keep you up if you are a slow metabolizer of caffeine next question when and how do you think is longevity escape velocity going to begin so the longevity escape velocity is this idea that as science and medicine progresses then at a certain point it's become so advanced that every chronological year that has passed the science and medical breakthroughs will enable you to live you know at least as much more alive and potentially even more so it's like this exponential curve in your life expectancy over the last century you've seen that life expectancy across the world has steadily increased so uh, right now in the world it's like 73.2 years or 74 years across the entire world and uh, some of the longest longest living countries like uh, Macau, Hong Kong, um, South Korea, Japan, they're like in the in the uh, low 80s, 83, 82, 84 years is the like average life expectancy in those countries. Now, is it going to reach a point where the life expectancy is going to be 200, which is the longevity escape velocity that in the year 2200, you will live 400 years because every year that has passed, we learn more and more about medicine that it just keeps you alive. Now, when is it going to happen? Well, theoretically, it's possible. I'll say that. So, like, I, I don't think there's anything, like, that would uh, say that it is impossible. The problem is, yeah, I think many people are overestimating how fast it would, or, like, overestimating when we would reach that point. So, there's Aubrey de Grey and others saying that it's going to happen in 2035, which is in 10 years. Others say it's 2040, 2045. So, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. But right now, there's no evidence that we're even, even close to that. Now, of course, yeah, maybe in five years, AI is going to be so advanced that it's going to figure it out and then we'll reach it super fast. So, yeah, the exponential curve is that it's exponential. <laughs> so, like, uh, it goes steadily, steadily, and then it's going up like a hockey stick. So, um, there's a lot of unknowns in that scenario. So, I don't necessarily know. Yeah, I, I don't... I'm not able to say, given like a definite prediction, okay, it's going to be 2034 or 2045. I have no idea based on the current uh, evidence because uh, it's very unpredictable. Now, personally, I'm more, uh, more thinking that it's probably not going to happen at the end of this century. It might take another 100 years <laughs> or something like that uh, for, for us to figure it out. So that's my personal belief based on you know what's out there right now because we have zero like evidence that we'll be able to extend the human lifespan beyond 120 right now the mathematical projections for average life expectancy is going to be that uh, the average life expectancy in south korea and etc on australia these richer countries 
it is going to be in the 90s uh, and uh, the, the longest living people will live over 120 but the, the the peak is like 130 years of age at the end of this century is is what the longest living people will be but uh, the average life expectancy is still going to be like maybe in the 90s in the next few decades so that's my personal belief based on the information that i've seen you know and uh, that doesn't t because it takes a lot of like almost like religious belief in ai to believe that the longevity escape velocity is here or that is uh, around the corner because you're like so deeply invested in the idea that you're just almost like religiously believing in it <laughs> without any actual concrete evidence uh, to support that idea because right now we literally have no evidence that it's possible although theoretically it would be possible but uh, practically no this episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your sleep wake on the cycles aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, use the more sleep friendly alternative by opting for flicker free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bond Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits as the traditional sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improves joint and skin health. Head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code SEAM, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. Next question, what would you do to improve your sleep when you sleep 7 to 8 hours, but I wake up 3 to 4 times? So, uh, that's a very classical scenario some people might get very little deep sleep some people might get very little REM sleep now from my own experience and experimentations I've noticed that uh, if I want to increase my deep sleep then I need to be more careful with blocking out blue light before bed and uh, avoiding food consumption before bed so I think if you extend the period of fasting before bed the, or you basically have an earlier dinner, then uh, that typically improves sleep quality and deep sleep specifically. And I have seen uh, minor improvements from that. So for blue blocking specifically, I've seen like 15% increase in my deep sleep. And with the earlier dinner, I've seen also something like 5 to 10% improvement. But uh, the earlier dinner for me also improves uh, REM sleep. So uh, I get more REM sleep as well if I stop eating Right now, I'm stopping like five hours before bed. Uh, whereas in the past, it might have been like three hours or something. And I've still seen improvements. For REM sleep, you also want to stay in bed for longer. So uh, it's important to understand the hierarchy of sleep or the sleep architecture. So the first half of the night, the first four hours when you go to bed, is predominantly uh, deep sleep or your body prioritizes deep sleep in that phase. And in the second half of the night, the last four hours of uh, sleep you're getting more REM sleep and less deep sleep so if you're suffering from either of them either REM sleep or deep sleep then you need to you need to look at which end of the sleep cycle are you uh, compromising in so like if you're compromising in the beginning of your sleep stage which would be getting exposed to blue light and uh, going to bed at the wrong time and uh, maybe eating too early or too close to bedtime then uh, those are the things that will improve your or reduce your sleep, deep sleep quality and for REM sleep it mostly comes down to similar things like food intake improved my REM sleep but uh, what improved my REM sleep was also staying in bed for longer so I if I if I wake up too early I get out of bed you know at like 5 a.m or something then yes my REM sleep is going to be cut short uh, so yeah like uh, if you are waking up too early then um, that might explain the low REM sleep but for deep sleep I would investigate more into yeah like the blue light the things that immediately impact your deep sleep in the in the beginning of the sleep cycle so like you can take magnesium glycine theanine something like that to block blue light and uh, stop eating at least four hours before bed I would try it out Next question, what's the biomarker or bodily function that you most want to improve that currently doesn't have a proven method of rejuvenation? So me personally, I don't have any like 
massive problems in my blood work or other health markers that I would want to improve. You know, I have mentioned I'm, I'm trying to get my homocysteine better, which is already, you know, in the good range. So homocysteine is a risk factor for heart disease. If it's too high, then it can cause endothelial, endothelial dysfunction and inflammation. My homocysteine was at 12, which is slightly above what would be optimal. So you want to get it below 10. 5 is the lowest risk. And uh, something between 5 to 10 is uh, kind of the sweet spot. And uh, I've gotten my homocysteine below 10 right now. So it's working and uh, you know I'm, I'm happy with it already. So I would try to get it even lower to like 5. And for that, I'm just increasing my trimethylglycine intake, uh, TMG. So I was taking 2 grams of TNG per day, which got me below 10. And uh, now I've increased it to 4 grams of TMG per day. So I'll measure homocysteine again and see if it even reduces it further. So homocysteine is very affected by genetics. It, it's affected by methylation, even affected by exercise, like exercising increases your homocysteine levels. And I exercise a lot and, and uh, you know, I might have some like uh, suboptimal methylation genes as well. So yeah, I might have to take larger amounts of uh, TMG to uh, reduce that. And there are other people who also exercise a lot but they have just lower homocysteine levels for whatever reason, for some other genetic reason. So it's a very like individual dependent uh, marker. There's from a dietary perspective, there's not a lot of actually foods that would like worsen your homocysteine unless you are like super deficient in B12 or some other uh, B vitamins. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's in interesting that it's uh, determined a lot by genetics. Now, when the second half of the question, like, is there any bodily function I would like to regenerate or um, that doesn't have currently evidence or proven methods of regeneration. So I'm just going to answer what would be beneficial for humanity as a whole, <laughs> not me. I think if, we're, if we were to able to like reverse coronary artery calcification and atherosclerosis, then that would just extend average human lifespan by at least you know five to ten years. And it would also eliminate one of the or reduce the burden of the biggest bottleneck in people's longevity which is heart disease so most people in the modern world will die to some form of heart disease and uh, you know it, it can happen in your 60s or 70s so it doesn't happen very late it happens pretty early relatively speaking in your uh, life expectancy journey so uh, yeah would if if we could find a way to regenerate like arteries or something or help to reverse coronary artery calcification consistently and like in 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 great ways or like in effective ways then that will be the biggest like longevity breakthrough right now for humanity uh, at least in the short term and uh, right now there are yeah like a few supplements that you can find okay reverses calcium scores or improves endothelial function or um, reverses soft plaque or something like that, reduces soft plaque. But uh, th those results aren't like massive. They're not like completely eradicating it. They're like, you see like a small decrease in your calcium score if you take a certain s supplement or statin or something like that. Uh, so we do have some things that have been shown to reduce these uh, calcium scores and plaque buildup, but they're not enough, <laughs> unfortunately. Like we want to have some sort of a breakthrough, like some other therapeutic that would, yeah, like completely eradicate it or completely regenerate it. Then it would be one of the biggest game changers for uh, the average life expectancy across the world. Next question, what do you think about mTOR signaling? Important for muscle growth, but also important to suppress for disease prevention slash longevity. Do you think these are opposite ideas and is there a trade-off, health span versus lifespan? Yeah, this is one of the age-old questions or one of the you know, main theories of longevity and uh, aging is the mTOR signaling theory that mTOR expression accelerates aging. And there is pretty compelling or very consistent studies in animals that, yes, excess mTOR signaling is linked to different cancers and shorter lifespans and suppressing mTOR with like rapamycin or calorie restriction or something else like that extends uh, animal lifespan and that I think is pretty widely accepted that it is the case in the longevity like scientific community uh, yeah but the problem is yeah that in humans there might be trade-offs if you chronically suppress mTOR signaling especially for muscle mass and muscle strength I think it's very 
it might be a little bit overblown the idea that suppressing mTOR would would like somehow shorten your lifespan yes you do need mTOR but uh, your body has very like good ways to also pre pre so there's I, I guess the issue is that the there's the, there's no studies actually looking at okay what does mTOR signaling do in humans uh, over the long term or um, what does chronic suppression of mTOR do in humans over the long term so chronic mTOR suppression it uh, can induce insulin resistance in people and uh, it can also uh, you know potentially reduce muscle mass now there is a, some some of the some of it has to do with uh, which mTOR complex mTOR complex are you suppressing so there's two mTOR complexes mTOR C1 and mTOR C2 if you suppress mTOR C2 then that uh, has been found to potentially increase the risk of insulin resistance maybe even like can have a negative effects on bone density but uh, not with mTOR C1 so uh, there are certain like these rapamycin or rapalogs that specifically target mTOR C1 which would uh, can avoid the risk of insulin resistance so you don't want to chronically suppress mTOR C2 but uh, suppressing mTOR C1 might have longevity benefits at least based on animal uh, studies now whether or not you want to suppress mTOR with rapamycin or something else you know I wouldn't do it right now based on the evidence but uh, you know from a dietary standpoint there are certain things that you can do within reason like you can do some aspects of calorie restriction which would mean that you you're not gaining too much weight and you maintain normal body weight then i think you already maintain a pretty good balance with this mTOR and i think the the key here is to just look at the biomarkers so there's no biomarker specifically to assess mTOR activation so you don't know are you expressing too much mTOR are you under expressing mTOR but there are a few like proxy biomarkers that you can use as well so like IGF1 I think it's a pretty good marker for assessing the growth signaling in the body. So too much, too high IGF-1 levels are linked to cancer and heart disease, but too low IGF-1 levels are also linked to increased frailty and increased mortality. So you could think, okay, you can use IGF-1 as a proxy to know are you in this excess growth state or are you too catabolic? Is there a risk for you to be too frail? With too low bone density and too low muscle mass or is there a risk of cancer if your IGF-1 level is too high and there was a recent 2023 meta-analysis that uh, looked at what's the optimal range for IGF-1 and it's like 115 to 130 uh, is the kind of sweet spot for the lowest risk and if your IGF-1 is like 300 400 then uh, that might be you know I would want to kind of reduce it to in the, into the 100s <laughs> at least now if your IGF-1 level is like below 100 then chances are you might be too frail you might have too low muscle mass you might not eat enough you might be malnourished so that's those are the things uh, that reduce IGF-1 expression like prolonged calorie restriction malnutrition and uh, frailty but again you need to measure your muscle mass and bone density as well then so if your bone density and muscle mass are high or adequate then I don't think you have a lot to worry about low IGF-1 levels because mo in most of the studies low IGF-1 levels are because of malnutrition primarily but if your bone density is high and your muscle mass is high your other biomarkers are fine then I'm personally thinking that low IGF-1 actually might be beneficial <laughs> if you have granted that you have high muscle mass and high muscle strength and high VO2 max and you know all these things so if you're a healthy fit person you're lean then a lower IGF-1 level is in my opinion at least I would think it's uh, better next question how can someone improve their hrv besides doing zone 2 cardio training and getting enough sleep is electrical current therapy worth considering so hrv yes being on the leaner side exercising regularly walking etc being kind of physically active those things will increase hrv typically and reduce your resting heart rate which is a good like adaptation other things that work i think like sauna like hot and cold therapy doing the sauna and ice bath or some cold shower even I think uh, that is also at least from my own experience uh, is, is what increases HRV quite quite a lot and uh, if you're already doing everything else then adding the sauna in my opinion would also uh, improve HRV now 
you don't want to overstress it <laughs> like chronic stress reduces hrv so you also need to make sure that yeah your body is able to handle it and uh, and uh you don't want to be, become too stressed about all the exercise that you might do or the saunas or whatever it is so yeah relaxation is important for that music therapy has been found to increase hrv so you just want to do things as well that make you feel good <laughs> like you know entertainment or uh, listening to music or socializing uh, just walking you know you don't always have to be like go 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 and uh, it will be counterproductive for the hrv intermittent fasting has also been found to increase HRV but extended fasting reduces it so some aspects of daily time restricted eating probably is beneficial but uh, too long or if you get it again getting too much sympathetic tone from the fasting then uh, that's not beneficial and uh, there is for walking almost like a linear association with HRV the more steps you take per day the higher the HRV is even up to 16 18,000 uh, steps so yeah these are the ones I think will be most beneficial and uh, I think from my own personal experience then fasting and sauna and exercise are the biggest th the three biggest things that has increased my HRV next question do you ever cheat meals like pizza or ice cream so the answer is you know if I want to then I'll do it <laughs> so the key here is that I'm not going to be doing some sort of uh, cheat meals or something like that every day and uh, overeat it so if you have moderation in uh, your food choices including cheat meals then it's not inherently going to be harmful for you you're going to be a getaway you, you will be able to get away with it yeah the key is just making sure that you're not like doing it consistently all the time and uh, what I like to do is just look at the like at the biomarkers you know if you're having some sort of a cheat meal once a week and your biomarkers are not very good then it means that you have some things to work on and I wouldn't do like the cheat meal I would try to optimize my biomarkers before that and uh, vice versa if you if your blood markers are perfect and uh, you're lean and healthy and fit you're exercising then uh, you know having a cheat meal once a week or something like that um, isn't going to jeopardize your progress and it's not going to worsen your blood markers either you know in some people it might then uh, I would be more careful with that but uh, yeah if it doesn't worsen your blood markers if you're still lean and healthy or strong then uh, yeah I wouldn't think that it's uh, inherently harmful next question astaxanthin blocks 5 alpha reductase does it pave way for more estrogen so 5 alpha reductase is the enzyme that converts testosterone into DHT which is the strongest kind of steroid hormone in the body which you know is beneficial for uh, muscle growth but it's also involved obviously in uh, prostate cancer and uh, hair loss now as the xanthin blocking 5 alpha reductase is it going to convert it into more estrogen then uh, logically no so like <laughs> just uh, or there's no evidence that it uh, would do so and there's actually evidence that the uh, astaxanthin actually might increase testosterone levels as well so there's actually at least one clinical trial where the combination of astaxanthin and saw palmetto extract resulted in greater testosterone levels in men so you know if you if you're looking at the yeah like the mechanistic pathways then you might come to the conclusion of that but there's no like um, at least right now no evidence of that and blocking that 5-alpha reductase you know actually might be from a longevity perspective might be more beneficial so uh, yeah for men at least so next question I don't take collagen but I take 35 grams of glycine per day is it enough for collagen synthesis so 35 grams of glycine per day that's more than you would get from a collagen supplement so if you take 10 grams of collagen then you're only getting three grams of glycine from there so yeah you're, you'll be getting 10 grams more or 11 times more um, 11 times more uh, glycine from this <laughs> glycine stack than the collagen now glycine is one of the most important amino acids in collagen synthesis and uh, I think you would see some benefits potentially the thing is that uh, the collagen peptides have like unique bioavailability and unique absorption that probably isn't replicated by glycine alone so uh, at least from the studies then the collagen peptides are the ones that do work and um, 
you know, glycine supports collagen synthesis, you know, we might eventually get some studies like looking at glycine supplementation and skin anti-aging or, or whatnot. But uh, yeah, I, I, I just prefer to base the decision on, okay, what are the studies out there right now? So right now we have the clinical trials on collagen peptides that they work for skin anti-aging and, uh, and uh, that's what I would still use. Now you can still use the glycine for the other reasons. So you still want to get more glycine than from the collagen peptides alone. You want to get the glycine for glutathione, you want to get glycine for creatine synthesis, uh, bile acid synthesis, uh, bile salt synthesis, a heme synthesis. So uh, yeah, there's many reasons why you want to get more glycine and lastly, you also want to get the glycine for the methionine balance. So most people are getting too much methionine and uh, excess methionine, you know, increases visceral fat. It might worsen insulin sensitivity and in animals it does also shortens their lifespan. So reducing that, like, or achieving a better glycine and methionine balance by increasing glycine intake, I think is beneficial for most people. Next question, what are your opinions on the supplement pterostilbene for longevity? So pterostilbene, it's uh, another stilbenoid, which is in the same family as resveratrol. And uh, it's thought to have like similar effects as resveratrol. And the only difference is that pterostilbene has greater bioavailability than resveratrol. So some people might think that it's even better than resveratrol. Now, the problem is that um, there's not a lot of clinical trials on pterostilbene yet. It has much less evidence than uh, resveratrol and uh, there's no evidence that it's going to extend lifespan in animals uh, either. So the few clinical trials on pterostilbene have shown that it's kind of safe or, uh, or orally tolerable, but it does reduce HDL cholesterol and increase LDL cholesterol as well. And in one of the studies, they found that pterostilbene supplementation reduced blood pressure while increasing LDL cholesterol. So I think the totality of evidence <laughs> just shows that, I mean, there's no real benefit to pterostilbene as of now. So, you know, it even increases LDL, which I wouldn't say is like a positive thing, especially if it uh, reduces HDL at the same time. So yeah, I, w I wouldn't take <laughs> pterostilbene. I think it's yeah pretty, pretty kind of useless uh, based on the evidence right now. Next question, essential supplements for vegans. So there are, you know, like only a handful supplements that your definitely going to benefit from if you are on a vegan diet there you know b12 i think every vegan should take like a b12 supplement most omnivores are also actually b12 deficient and uh, the most reliable method to prevent that is to take like a b12 supplement especially if you are on a plant-based or vegan diet and the second supplement probably is like uh, creatine for vegans so yes your body makes a certain amount of creatine you can make some creatine from uh, glycine but, uh, you know, a vegan diet doesn't contain <laughs> that much glycine and uh, it's much easier to just supplement three to five grams of creatine. You're getting, you know, way more even than you would on a, on a carnivore diet. So it's hard to get five grams of, of creatine even on a carnivore diet unless you're eating something like four kilograms of meat or two kilograms of herring, something like that. So uh, even vegans and omnivores both would benefit from from a creatine supplementation. And the last one I would maybe, yeah, like, so it's not a, yeah. So the problem is there's no vegan collagen supplement and you're obviously not getting any collagen from your uh, foods either if you're on a, on a vegan diet. You are also not getting a lot of methionine from the vegan diet. So your demand for glycine is also theoretically lower, but I think most vegans still would benefit from increasing glycine. So just taking glycine, because you can't take collagen, I would just take, you know, 10, 15 grams of glycine as a supplement if you are a vegan. So these three, I think, are the best. Uh, B12, creatine, and uh, glycine. Next question, in your opinion, what's the best way to prevent cancer? So cancer is a unfortunate disease because, uh, you know, you could be otherwise healthy and not visibly sick, kind of, and still get cancer, whereas, you know, if you're over overweight and uh, and uh, not exercising etc then 
you know, you know you're increasing your risk of heart disease and, and diabetes and Alzheimer's. Whereas with cancer is something like, yeah, like even like relatively healthy and visibly healthy people can still get cancer. So I think the most important thing to prevent cancer is to do routine checkups, just to go to your doctor and ask for checkups for uh, certain cancers. And, you know, obviously there's different tests to do and uh, detecting the cancer early enough is the most powerful way to... Um, avoid it getting serious <laughs> so and uh, early detection is you know the key here and it also depends a lot on your age group so if you're 20 then your doctor is never going to like do some sort of a cancer checkup for you uh, unless there's something wrong in your blood work or some other like serious health conditions that you might have so yes like uh, you should try to yeah, start uh, let's say monitoring certain key biomarkers for that and doing like routine checkups you know, definitely in your 40s, uh, starting in your 40s. Next question, how do we improve skin elasticity? So skin elasticity, the supplements, suppleness of the skin declines with age and, um, you know, collagen supplementation, collagen peptide supplementation has been found to increase skin elasticity. Skin hydration also declines with age. And uh, for that, the, the hyaluronic acid supplementation has also been found to uh, support that skin hydration as well as skin elasticity. So the best skin and aging supplements that I think uh, have been proven to work are collagen peptides, hyaluronic acid, and uh, astaxanthin. So astaxanthin at 12 milligrams a day also, first of all, it protects your skin against UV radiation, and it also has been found to support uh, skin elasticity. So yeah, these are the supplements uh, I'm taking and I think do work. And you know, drinking regular water, sleeping enough, and uh, having a good diet, those all, all, th all those things are also obviously uh, quite important. And the last question is, do periods of calorie deficit harm your exercise performance? The most logical answer is yes, <laughs> because if you're you know, not eating enough food, you're kind of uh, undernourished and uh, deprived of energy, then yeah, you're not going to be performing at your peak or not at your best. And, uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of like truth to the idea that under eating calories will make you lose muscle and make you lose strength but what they find in these uh, calorie trials these uh, two-year randomized controlled trials on calorie restriction is that uh, the calorie restriction does reduce muscle size but uh, your muscle strength stays relatively the same and kind of the quality of the muscle increases so your muscles have like less volume but they're like fiber, fiber for fiber stronger based on the volume, so to say. Like it's just, just the ratio of strength the muscle increases or the quality of the muscle increases because uh, you're just carrying less muscle mass in that sense. So I, I think, you know, prolonged calorie restriction, yeah, like if you're under calorie restriction for years, you will lose some strength, you will lose some muscle mass, but you can maintain it quite adequately. Granted that you're doing some form of resistance training and you're eating enough protein. So uh, the resistance training is the biggest factor for muscle strength and muscle mass and to maintain it especially. So if you're ever in a calorie deficit, then uh, you should always do some form of resistance training. You don't want to go crazy with it because if you're like very catabolic with your exercise, you're just lifting weights for hours every day, then you will lose muscle and strength because of that. But moderate uh, like amounts of resistance training with still pretty high intensity, uh, that would be the best for maintaining muscle. So what I like to look at is that, yes, I'm going to reduce my weight a little, or I'm, I'm expecting to lose a little bit of strength. So I'm having to reduce the weight I lift by maybe five kilos, but I'm not going to be starting to lift half the weight I used to, because that's a signal for your body that it doesn't need the muscle strength anymore and you're going to lose the strength much more so you still want to perform as like um, intensely as you were before the calorie restriction but you can just you know naturally expect to lose maybe five to ten percent of your strength with a uh, cardiovascular exercise uh, it they find that it doesn't you know hinder cardiovascular or vh uh, performance uh, that much of course you're not going to be like an elite level athlete <laughs> by being in a calorie deficit all the time but uh, the cardiorespiratory fitness inherently isn't going to be damaged or suffer it's not going to suffer from a calorie restriction and it might actually improve it 
because you lose weight so you like you know run faster a little bit because you carry less weight so yeah exercise in a calorie deficit saves a lot of things <laughs> so if you're in a calorie deficit without any exercise you're going to lose a lot of muscle mass and muscle strength and uh, endurance as well but if you keep exercising you keep lifting weights and i would add eating a high protein diet at the same time that's the best thing like a lot of the fitness competitors they eat super high protein they lift weights and uh, they're in a very high calorie deficit so they lose like you know all the fat <laughs> they lose a lot of fat in the process but they're still pretty strong you know they're not as strong as they're if they're bulking but they're still strong uh, relatively speaking when we're talking about or if you compare them to like the average people so yeah high protein exercise lifting weights and cardio while in a calorie deficit is is is, is very good to do and it will maintain most of the physical performance that you had before. All right, that's it for this Q&A. If you want to ask me a question in the future, then make sure you follow me on Instagram, at Seamlund. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click like and subscribe. My name is Seam. Stay optimized, stay empowered.